recording has started. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this Polar Connect event on Friday, July 27th. We've got Christina Solis and Ken Miller of the research project that's taking place up in Barrow, Alaska. We're getting a hold of Elliot Friedman right now as well. So Christina Solis has been up in Barrow studying microorganisms and greenhouse gas emissions in the thawing Arctic permafrost. And she wanted to make sure that she could do a special presentation for your group down there at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. So this is just for you all. We hope that you come up with questions throughout the presentation. And while we're here together, I can explain a little bit more about uh, how this internet platform, this online platform works. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. And you should see a screen that's changed. And, and let me know if your, uh, your slides aren't changing. But right now, it's showing you what's available. So we've got our, our slides coming up there in the front, in the middle. And on the left, there are a list of participants. So we've got all of you together at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And if you ever have a question or something like that, you can click and raise your hand. And we can call on you. And you can ask your questions live. And just below the participant box, you can ask questions through the chat. Too. So Christina, I'm sure, will welcome questions throughout the presentation. And she's clapping right now, too. So you can add little emoticons and, uh, and share your thoughts with us as we're going along. And we're just curious to know how many people are over there. I'll turn off the mic so Cabrillo can answer. How many people are over there with you? About 30. Wow, that's great. Perfect. And we have Elliot Friedman signing on, too. He is uh, part of the project. We're getting him set up here. And let me tell you a little bit about uh, the Polar Trek program. So this is a professional development experience for K-12 teachers. And that's who Christina Solis is and how she's involved with us. We're sending teachers to the Arctic and the Antarctic to learn about polar science and to bring it back into classrooms and communities. So hopefully, when she gets back, you guys can take advantage of having Christina nearby and learn more about the polar regions. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, again, if we have questions during the presentation, you're welcome to type them in the chat. And at the end, we can certainly take questions live from all of you for Christina up in, in, in Barrow, Alaska. So we have Elliot joining us. Elliot, you want to test and make sure your microphone is working over there? Are you talking to me? Yeah, no worries. I just wanted to know if your microphone was working. So that's perfect. I'm going to start your slides here, Christina. And if you feel like you're ready, go right ahead. Good morning, everyone, and especially to the junior doses at CMA. Uh, my name is Christina Solis. And right now, what you're looking at is our research team uh, for this summer. Um, my picture is over here on the right. I work at Los Angeles Academy Middle School as an eighth grade physical science teacher. And I'm also a Polar Trek teacher this year, one of 12. Uh, so it's really exciting to be part of the program. It's a huge honor. And I just love working in science. And I love working with my research team, which you see in the photos. Um, to the left of my picture is Kim Miller, who is also um, presenting today. And she's from San Diego State University. To the left of her photo is Elliot Friedman, who's um, joining us from Ithaca, New York, from Cornell University. Um, he is my uh, primary researcher. Now, below him is a picture of Dr. David Lipson, also from San Diego State University. Uh, he is a primary investigator there. And on the right of his photo is Dr. Lars Anginet from Cornell University. And to the right of his photo is Dr. Ted Robb from Stanford University. So this is our research team this year. And it's been a great team. I've, I've met most I've met um, Lars and, of course, Elliot and Kim working out here. And I've actually been able to kind of overhear some conversations Kim has had 
with David and Ted, so it's great to be fully connected in the team. So I think we work really well together this summer. Uh, let's go on to our next slide. I think I can take you guys. Oops. Oh, thanks. Um, so where exactly is Barrow, Alaska? So um, as you can see, um, students, Barrow is located in Alaska, which is our 49th state. And that takes, um, it's located roughly 330 miles above the Arctic Circle. And you can see in the first image on the left where the North Pole is indicated and the Arctic Circle that is um, located in that region nearby. Um, the city of Barrow itself is no, noted on the map of Alaska on the right, and you can see it's got this large orange arrow. And it's about 1,300 miles from the North Pole, so pretty darn close to it. Um, I have a picture of an airplane, airplane below because Barrow, the city of Barrow, is only accessible by airplanes. There are no roads connecting Barrow to other cities. And basically, you can only get here using an airplane or maybe a helicopter to some of the posts by towns like Prudhoe Bay or uh, Aquasuck. But basically, you have to get here on airplane only. So Bear is pretty far from the rest of the contiguous 48 states. Um, I want to go ahead and talk about life in the Arctic Circle. Let's see here. Okay. Um, so I have a lot of pictures here that show so many things. I'm just going to start on the left side uh, where researchers live in huts. And you see the three pictures on the left. Um, our hut in particular where Kim and I and Elliot live um, is the one with the white truck. And you see it's kind of like a, I don't know, a square shaped building. And it's basically like um, a mini apartment. At any given summer, there's about hundreds a few hundred scientists who show up for the season of research and they're going to live in accommodations such as that. Uh, the huts have modern amenities such as a kitchen. You can see me standing in the kitchen in the photo below. There's, you know, a stove, refrigerator, and microwave. And most researchers end up cooking their own meals for dinner, et cetera, because um, we need to be all ready to go out in the field at any given time, et cetera. Um, Let's see. Um, in terms of houses for residents, in the upper right, there's three pictures. Um, there's about, well, there's over 4,000 people who call Barrow home full time. And they have a part of town where they would live in. Uh, the photograph that shows a row of houses It's pretty much what a typical street would look like and a couple of typical houses. I've also put um, single photographs of that as well. Um, residents who live in the houses or apartments in town, they have a very similar life to what we do. They have, you know, they have to go to school if you're in elementary or middle or high school. They have a high school football team. Um, you have to drive around probably in a four-wheel drive truck or an ATV. Um, actually, lots of the residents also have their own boats because there's, uh, we're so close to the Arctic Ocean and going out on boat is very common. Um, the city itself has Grocery, a grocery store, an ice rink, five or so restaurants, a bank, a lot of government offices, two radio stations. But probably what the kids would not like to know is there's no movie theater and there's no mall. So if you need something <laughs> important, you have to go get on an airplane and go to Anchorage and do your major shopping over there. Um, what I thought was interesting to note is in the top right corner where the, arrow, where the hand is showing is that all the buildings here are built on stilts. Um, building on permafrost, which I'll go into later, the permanently frozen soil, is difficult because the building um, generates heat because there's people and there's pipes and there's lines of water running. Um, therefore, that can kind of thaw the permafrost and the structure can be really destabilized and can start sinking into the ground. So structures here in Barrow or any place that's built on permafrost needs these stilts. And these stilts are actually pretty deep. Um, they go like maybe 49 feet sometimes into the ground. And at this temperature, uh, this way the building is away from the permafrost and the chance of sinking is decreased by having these stilts. Um, the pictures below show us working in the Arctic. So it's a combination for the scientists of working in a very modern lab, as you can see in the bottom picture with Elliot working on his computer. 
um, with just the you know, all the safety, personal uh, protective equipment, um, all the supplies we need, et cetera, in a very modern lab. And then a combination of also going out into the field or your research site, which is what shows a picture of me being outdoors, actually at the place where we collect the data and perform the manipulations and do our experiments. So that kind of summarizes life for the researchers. There's living in the hut, visiting town, and of course doing our primary work. Let me go ahead and move on to the weather. Okay. And oh, at any time someone who is interested in asking a question can always type in the chat box or you can write a question down and you can ask us later. So don't be shy. We like to hear lots of questions. So getting back to the weather, um, in terms of weather, Barrow gets pretty much a pretty low average temperature in Alaska. Um, this summer they told me that the typical weather is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so that has actually gone up and down depending on the day. In fact, you can see a photo of me at the bottom where it snowed. And so it was pretty cold that day and I'm wearing my gloves and my snow goggles and my hat and my thick jacket. And then there's days where it's kind of warm, like 65 degrees. And so there's a picture of Kim to the right of me and she's wearing a short sleeve t-shirt and she's sweating and she has a headband on because it was 65 degrees and we were doing some manual labor that day. So the weather can be really uh, cold and snowy or it can be really hot. Um, in terms of the snow, Barrow does get snowfall every month of the year. So we did see snow in July, this July. Um, but it wasn't the kind of snow that would like um, gather up and you can make snowballs, but it was still snow nonetheless, which was kind of exciting to see in July. Um, the picture that's a postcard right underneath weather, that actually um, talks about the 24 hours of sunlight. Um, because of where Barrow is located, um, they have 24 hours sunlight from about June to August. I would say. So if I look out my window at 1 a.m., I see, still see sunlight, which is kind of exciting and kind of cool because you can see kids playing at the playground at 11 o'clock at night. It's just so different not having a twilight or an evening sky with stars. And then one thing about the weather I don't like is the picture to the far right in the top corner is the mosquitoes. Um, when it's not blowing super cold wind, the mosquitoes seem to rise up and really like to hang out with us researchers as we're trying to get our work done. And the mosquitoes, we've noticed, are pretty um, excited to be around us. Um, <laughs> one of my journals is about mosquitoes. And what I was writing in that journal was, oh, they can sense our carbon dioxide we breathe out, that they're really attracted to clothing of contrasting colors. So seeing us wearing our bright colored outfits, the mosquitoes have really found us easily out in the tundra. Let's go ahead and go on to the landscape and some of the animals and plants of the area. Okay, so here's another collage of photos. Um, the tundra here is shown in the left picture at the top. She looks like a big field of grass. And basically the tundra is a biome with extremely cold weather. It's a really, really short growing season and they have a permanently frozen subsoil underneath called permafrost and that's what I told you about earlier with why the buildings might start um, sinking. Um, permafrost is uh, basically frozen subsoil. Uh, there's very few plants that grow in a tundra. In fact, what I've seen so far are some, you know, the grasses you see in that tundra picture, a couple of flowers at the bottom. Um, my favorite is the little white puffy one. Kim, what's the name of the puffy white one again? Periophyllum vaginatum, oh. cotton grass. It's so fluffy, it's like cotton ball on a stick. It's really cool. And then in terms of, um, let's see, birds or animals, there's lots of birds. Um, that's probably the most I've seen on the tundra. There's a long-billed bird that has a longer beak, and um, that's a dowitcher. The smaller birds you see next to him are uh, different kinds of sandpipers. And then 
in the far upper corner on the right, we saw a huge tundra swan and some baby swan wings um, once near our site. So that was kind of exciting. Those tundra swans are super tall, almost as tall as Elliot, if I recall correctly. And they ran away when they saw us after they squawked at us a couple times. Um, some other animals that have not yet to have the chance to see but are prevalent in Barrow are things like caribou or reindeer, uh, arctic foxes, and of course polar bears. And I'm hoping before I leave when I get a glimpse of one. And I'm also going to talk about bowhead whales um, and a few slides as well. So those are the types of things you end up seeing if you were to come visit me in Barrow. So let's see, interesting things about Barrow. Okay. So, um, one of the cool things about Barrow is being right by the Arctic Ocean. And you can see that there is sea ice here and they form such beautiful, I don't know, like sculptures almost. And you can see the icicles in some of the pictures as well. Uh, in one of my journals I talked about how sea ice is super cold because the freezing point of ocean water is less than regular water. So when you touch sea ice you're getting a really, really cold. Um, feeling in your hand. Um, sea ice is special because it's only found in remote polar oceans, so like Barrow. So some people never get to see sea ice, and I get to see it every day when I look out over the horizon. Um, sea ice is important because it regulates temperature in the polar regions. And remember, sea ice is not a glacier because glaciers are fresh water and sea ice is ocean salty water. Uh, the picture on the right corner uh, the upper right corner, I should say, are some of the native locals, um, Inupiat Eskimos, as you can see, wearing some of their more traditional clothing at an Independence Day celebration. In um, fact, um, many locals do speak the native language, and you can hear it on the one of two radio stations they have in Barrow. Um, I think what's most marked about the um, community is that they have historically hunted bowhead whales for uh, sustenance, and they follow some of their traditional Eskimo practices um, in doing so. And in fact, you'll see some bowhead whale photos below. Um, there's an actual bowhead whale photo um, that I was able to get free from the internet. Um, bowhead whales are named that way because they have a very distinctive looking bowhead shape, mouth, um, um, head I should say, bowhead uh, shaped head. And it's actually 40% of their body length. So they are a lot of face on that whale. Uh, they have two blowholes and they're baleen whales, which means they are filter feeders. So they don't eat fish, they don't attack people. They are um, kind of skim the water and they filter in plankton, tiny crustaceans like krill. And bowheads are actually have some of the longest baleen of all the other whales. They can grow to be 50 or 60 feet and can weigh up to 80 to 110 tons. In fact, there is another researcher, another polar effect teacher, Lisa, who will be studying bowhead whales right after I come home. So if you would want to follow her journals, if you're interested in these whales, that would be an excellent polar trek teacher to follow. Um, as you can see to the right, there is a picture of a whale graveyard. And as I mentioned before, the local people do hunt the whales. And to prevent um, polar bears and other scavenger animals from entering the city, they bring the remains to a farther off place from the city so that the townspeople are safe. Um, so you can see some of the skeletons there, the vertebrae, the rib bones. It's just it's like looking at dinosaurs, the sheer size. It's really, really amazing. Um, I also have a picture of me sitting on one of the um, skulls from one of the welcome signs. And I guess what's not notable is that the Inupiat people have really contributed to the understanding of bowhead whales. For example, their anatomy and physiology and the food habits and responses to how ocean life responds to oil spills and other disasters. So they've actually contributed a lot to science and our understanding. So I think that's something that may, many people might not realize about the community. Cool. So let's go ahead and talk about the research. So I'm going to turn it over to Elliot, and he's going to introduce you to what we're doing here in terms of the science of our trip this summer. OK, great. Thanks, Christina. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? 
do Sarah if you just want to let me know in the chat box. Talk a little louder. Okay. I can talk louder. Um, well, anyway, what we're doing here, um, what Kim and I do, is we study the tundra and we study the bacteria that live in the tundra. And basically what we're interested in um, is what types of different bacteria there are and how they compete with each other um, for food and resources and what happens as a result of that. Um, and so basically there are competing processes that are happening in the tundra. Um, there's photosynthesis by the plants that you can see in these pictures and they take carbon from the atmosphere and, and create plant matter. And on the other hand, there's bacteria that live in the soil and they're eating dead plant matter and they're moving the carbon back from the tundra into the atmosphere. So there's basically two ways that carbon is moving between the, the soil um, and the plants and the atmosphere. And we're, we look at um, what controls the balance between these two. And specifically we look um, in wetland sites and a lot of the area around Barrow is wetlands um, and specifically there are these uh, features called drain fall lake basins and they exist only in these high latitude areas uh, because they're formed as a result of climate and freeze thaw freeze thawing processes. So despite the fact that um, Barrow is very cold and they have snow, it is also a arctic desert and they get a very small amount of rainfall and snowfall a year. So what's unique about these wetlands? Well, since there's so much water sitting there, um, there's a lot of water because there's permafrost underneath the soil and there's no place for the water to go. So when it rains uh, here in New York or in California, it rains and the rain seeps into the soil and moves down that way so it's not sitting on the surface here. Uh, it's mostly sitting on the surface because there's no place for it to go because there's a layer of frozen soil underneath. And so what we have in, when we have waterlogged soils like this is we have um, no oxygen conditions, so we call these anaerobic conditions, and we also have lots of carbon from all this dead plant matter. So you can see the, the grasses and um, some of the plants that Christina talked about are growing in these pictures, and when they die, they basically, they don't decompose uh, right away, but they're sitting there, and the, the only way they decompose is via these bacteria. And so these bacteria are very important to what's happening in the overall carbon balance. And so, like I mentioned, there are different types of bacteria, and they compete for food and vitamins and minerals and other resources that they need to live. And different bacteria produce different things. Specifically, we're interested in the gases that they produce as byproducts of their metabolism. And you might wonder why this is important. Well, these, there's, like I mentioned, there's this delicate balance between carbon coming in to the tundra and out of the atmosphere from photosynthesis and carbon being released back into the atmosphere because of um, the bacteria. And if we change the climate, we can change the balance between these two processes. And this has the potential to be what we call a positive feedback loop. So if we as humans cause the climate to warm and there's, we can shift the balance between the bacteria and the photosynthesis. And in the, bo in the bottom one, what you see there is we would have increased um, degradation of organic matter by microorganisms and we'd have them, so there'd be more bacteria because if we increase the temperature, then um, we're going to thaw up more of the soil. And so there's going to be a greater amount of soil for the bacteria to live in, which means more bacteria. And also it's going to be warmer for longer. So these bacteria are very active over the summer when there are warmer temperatures. And if we make these warmer temperatures persist for a longer amount of time, then they're going to be more active. And so they have the potential for releasing more of these, this carbon that's trapped in the tundra back into the atmosphere. Uh, and then we move, and then this can cause the greenhouse uh, gas effect again, so more climate change. 
So, now I see that you're having trouble hearing me. Let me try something different. Is this any better now? Can you hear me better? Okay. All right. Well, um, so this can be what we call a positive feedback loop. And this is where we get into a loop where we, as humans, initially cause an increase in, in temperature and longer summers, and we, um, we have increased greenhouse gas emissions, and then this in turn leads to more longer, hotter summers, and we get into this vicious cycle. So we believe that it's very important to study this and have some way of knowing what might happen if we, um, if we do have climate change in these high latitudes. And so the, now that we know that we want to study this, we have to figure out how can we study this. And the primary thing that I do is I use what are called microbial electrochemical systems to study the bacteria. So obviously we can't go out and look at bacteria like we would go out if we were studying, studying animals. So we have to find another way. And what I do is I use these systems to link the microbial metabolism, so the bacteria and them eating food and, and reproducing and surviving, um, to electronic circuitry. So I put them together and we get these microbial electrochemical systems. And this allows us to measure the activity of the bacteria. And so we're taking what the bacteria do in their, in their daily lives and we're connecting it to electronics and that way we can get a, a measurement out on a computer. And this, this is an overview of, of these microbial electrochemical systems. And they do a lot of different things. So in the middle, you could see an example of what we do when we put these systems into the tundra. So that was last year. This is what it looked like when we were working up there. These systems can also create energy. So bacteria can create energy from or organic matter, whether it be in the soil or also from wastewater. And they can also do biocomputing. So what we can do is we can actually have bacteria make a decision based on things that are going on, where they give us a yes or a no based on things that are happening. And so here's an example of what things look like in the field. Um, so we have some equipment that gets buried in the soil. And these are equipment that, this is equipment that I've built. And we go out and we put it in there and we power electronics with solar panels, which is very um, easy to do in this specific environment because I, I believe Christina mentioned that we have 24 hours of sunlight this time of year in Vero. So this is the um, part that, of the research that I do. And I think I'm going to pass it on to Tim now. Or no, I have one more slide. So, I'll give you an introduction to what we're doing this year, and we want to know what the relationship between these competing microbial processes are, and how do they either compete or do they coexist? Are they both, are, are many things happening at the same time? We also want to know what are the major factors responsible for controlling microbial dominance. So what, what are the most important things, like rather than going out and having to specifically look at the bacteria, can we look at something easier? Can we measure temperature or pH? And will that tell us right away what bacteria are, are um, out competing the other ones? And finally, we want to know how accurately can current climate models predict methane emissions and greenhouse gas emissions from this site? So basically, people have built models to predict what's going to happen. And the best way to test these models is to go out and get the actual data that we're doing and then see how accurately the models um, predict what's happening. And with that, I will pass it along to Kim. OK, can you all hear me all right? I can. <laughs> I don't know how to tell. they're going to respond, but you can just keep talking. Okay, I'm going to assume that you can hear me. Um, okay, so just leading in from Elliot's stuff. 
Um, what I study is just a side element of that, and what we know is that a lot of greenhouse gases are coming off of these soils from these bacterial communities, but we don't um, totally understand why certain greenhouse gases um, come out in the quantities that they do. And so what you have here is a typical wetland soil. Um, along the top there's a blue line, and that's actually the water line, and so below that everything in the picture doesn't have oxygen available to it, um, which is really typical in a wetland. And the box on the left side, um, so anytime you see a circle or an oval, those are microbial communities or functional groups, so microbes that do the same thing, like they reduce iron or they reduce manganese. Um, and every time you see a square or a, a rectangle, that's something that the microbes are using like acetate or um, CO2 that they're creating. And so what we have here is everything that's going along in the soil. So if you start with the complex organic material underneath that sort of plant picture, that's, that's the biggest type of sugar that you can have. And all of these microorganisms are using sugars in the soils to um, breathe and to eat. And so what they breathe out is CO2 or methane. Um, when there's no oxygen available, and even if there is, just like we breathe in O2 or oxygen and we breathe out CO2, so do microbes. So one of our questions is between CO2 and methane, which you see both um, from the surface being emitted from the soil, if you give it a common source of carbon or a common source of those sugars, what determines if it goes into a pathway or to a microbial population that produces methane and what determine or, or does it go to a microbial population that produces CO2, which is that entire left-hand side. Um, and so that's what I look at in my research and what Elliot was also talking about. And so um, we're doing an experiment this summer where we give them that acetate, that simple sugar, and we look at just this um, change into, from the acetate, that sugar, into either a CO2 or a CO2 pathway or a CH4 pathway. And so again, that microbial um, competition for carbon, which is what they're going to be getting more of if the permafrost is degrading. Okay, so I, we look at this in two ways. The gases that are produced by the microbes they're essentially breathing just like us, and so they do get trapped in the water because it is a wetland, and so you can get them out of the water, and they slowly move through the water up, but because they're just sort of like bubbles, they move a lot slower. So one way is you can directly get the gas out of the water if you just take the water out. So we use this vacuum tube. You can see this is a soil collar buried in the ground and it just is a tube that you dig into the dirt and so you know exactly the column of dirt that you're dealing with. And then we put in this little um, vacuum style tube attached to a needle and it will draw the water out from the soil. And so we draw that water out. This is a picture of some of the water vials. We call it bog tea because it has a lot of organics and things in it that make it look kind of like tea colored. Then we can use gas um, chromatography and it will tell us the amount of CO2 and methane trapped in the soil water. So we can get a really direct measurement of what's trapped in the soil water um, and that hasn't had to even move throughout the water. It's very close to the microbes that are producing it. And then we also do a fancy laser machine that we're using for the first time this year um, that, also, uh, that does it in the air. So after the microbes have already breathed out and the CO2 and methane have moved to the top of the surface, it's what the ground is burping essentially. And so we use this laser and the laser sucks in the air through those yellow tubes that you can see in all the pictures. It pulls the air in and then it measures with the laser the amount of CO2 and methane in the air. And so with every soil collar, which you see in the top right, or sorry, top left picture, we take the cap off, we let it um, experience the atmosphere, 
and then we know like, okay, um, what's the baseline level of methane and CO2 just in the air coming off of all of the soil? And then we put the cap on in that central picture and it limits it to just the soil or just the air being sort of burped out of that single amount of soil. So then we can um, measure the just the amount of soil come, or air coming out of that area and then do a mathematical calculation to see how much would come out of the entire area. Um, so those are the ways that we've been measuring the CO2 and the methane um, to answer some of those questions that Elian and I were talking about. Thanks. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about um, what I've been able to help out with the team. So as a teacher, I am not a professional scientist and I don't have a PhD in science, but I know I'm really interested in the subject and it was a great opportunity to see the scientific method, which I talk a lot about in my classroom, being utilized in the field with current science that's being discovered right now. So as you can see, a regular person such as a student or a teacher or a citizen can do things such as setting up a research site in the top two left pictures in the left upper corner. You can see I'm bringing out supplies and equipment to set up our um, expedition site. Um, you can also see the field where we have the matting that's been laid out and the soil collars and all those things wouldn't be possible without a team of people working together to set up these things and that's what I've been able to contribute to the team. Um, <clears throat> in addition is also to take the reading. So I'm wearing um, my pink sweatshirt there and I'm actually working with the collars, putting the cap on and taking the cap off for Tim and Elliot and that requires someone who's really careful, make sure they don't disturb the collars, um, is really conscientious about keeping um, accurate accuracy in terms of putting the collars on and off. Um, you can also see there's a lot of computer work involved, so you need to be able to use the log sheet and the spreadsheets and the graphing um, programs on there in order to, you know, collect the data and to report the data, data accurately so that when we come back home to our respective universities, we have all the information organized in a way that we can access and then write final reports from. Um, Others, the, um, the upper two right pictures, upper right corner, are again me working in the field, putting on the caps, et cetera. Um, also not pictured is things like follow-up and communication, um, really keeping an open line of communication between myself and the researchers by talking or emailing or phone calling, that's super important. And then in the future, things are coming up, um, I will be creating a couple of lesson plans for middle schools, so maybe your teachers uh, back at home will be using some lessons I've created for you. And also, I will be um, hosting a teacher workshop at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium with a principal investigator, uh, Dr. David Lipson, and that's going to be in November, so I'll be back in your part of town at um, your aquarium doing a teacher workshop for hopefully some of the teachers at your school. So let's go ahead and do some acknowledgments. There's a lot of organizations, a lot of people we want to thank, um, many of which are listed on the slide here, as well as uh, last year's Polar Trek teacher, Jim Miller, who was instrumental in some of the research last summer, um, the Anginet Lab at Cornell, um, the Lipson Lab in San Diego, um, Stanford University as well. So thanks to all of those groups listed and the ones I said verbally. And let's see here, um, oh, um, would you like to take over for this slide, Ms. Sarah or Janet? We'll get to this in a minute. I hope we have a minute for questions from Cabrillo. Cabrillo, go ahead and turn your mic on. Let us know if you have any questions. We'll try and keep our answers short so we can ask more than one. We have one question. Uh, since there's 24 hours of sunlight, uh, how do you time your research? Like, what time do you do your research? Christina? Yeah, with the 24 hours of sunlight, it's interesting. It either encourages you to work continuously <laughs> for the 24 hours straight or you try to make yourself a schedule. Um, 
I don't know, it's actually been a blessing and also not so good. It's a blessing because if you forget to do something in the field, like you're like, oh, I need to bring out this one treatment or I need to install a few more things out in the field, you have the daylight to do it. Um, so a couple times Elliot or Kim have been out till 8 or 9 p.m. at night and they have full sunshine in, in, in order to do their work. But at the same time, they came home at 8 or 9 at night, so then they're exhausted for the next day of work. So it's great because you can do whatever you need for your research, but at the same time, it causes you to overwork yourself at times. So it's just try to keeping a, to a regular schedule is pretty helpful so you don't fatigue yourself unnecessarily. Question, Cabria, if you have another one, just type yes in the chat box and I'll let you get set up for that. I'll ask a quick question if Cabrillo is working on one. Um, oh, good. There is one. Have you gone swimming in the Arctic? Actually, I think all three of us have. Elliot, Kim, and myself have at different times. Um, I went most recently, and there is a journal post about it. And I believe Elliot called it my polar bear plunge. And apparently it's a, I don't know, kind of a, a thing to do out here that if you're going to make it all the way to Barrow, that your trip is not complete unless you jump in the water, fully submerging yourself, including your head, and then come back out of the water. Um, I have to say that when I did mine, it wasn't as bad as I thought. One, because I think people kept warning me I was going to be super cold. And the second was that the uh, regular air temperature before you got in the water was already cold. So when you got into the water, you were just cold again. And so you went from cold to cold again, and it wasn't as bad as I thought. So I highly recommend it. So when you come up and visit Barrow, <laughs> if you have a chance to jump in the water with your parents' permission, you should definitely <laughs> do it. There's another question in the chat box there for you, Christina, and then we'll uh, we'll try and sign off and give you time to wrap up over there, Cabrillo. Yeah. So, what other gases besides carbon dioxide and methane are produced? So, um, carbon dioxide is one of the main gases that pro is produced, and um, in in these environments, methane. Um, there are also some other gases like nitrous oxides or hydrogen sulfide um, that are produced. But um, first of all, we're, we're mainly focused on methane um, and carbon dioxide. And, and uh, also, um, one of the reasons that we are focused on methane is because of the, envir the environment in Barrow and the wetlands that we work in are very conducive to methane. So there are other researchers that in different areas and different soil types study um, nitrogen oxide emissions and, um, and emissions of, of different types of sulfide compounds like hydrogen sulfide. But um, for the most part, carbon dioxide and methane would be the main ones produced in, in our site. And Kim can feel free to weigh in on that if she wants. All right, it looks like Cabrillo is typing there. I think we're just about going to run out of time here. Um, any other questions from you guys over there? I think you're good. Um, I'm going to put up a slide here while you're typing. Oh, what is the purpose or application for it? Bio and uh, Bioenergy. Probably have time for this. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So that um, is doesn't really have to do with the Arctic. It's just another type of thing that we can do with the same type, with the same technology that we're using in the Arctic. So other people in my lab here at Cornell and at other places, other universities are working on um, trying to actually, we can create energy from bacteria. So um, basically we can, at this point we can power small lights and LEDs or fans um, just by taking actually wastewater from um, either 
a local sewage treatment plant or from the food industry or the, or the beverage industry and we put it into what's called the microbial fuel cell and we can make power. Um, and so obviously the applications of that would be that we could make energy from, uh, from some type of wastewater but right now um, most people are still working on this at very small scales in the lab and um, trying to figure out whether we would be able to build these on big scale, on larger scales. Great, thanks. And it looks like uh, Janet's answering that questions about uh, language. So she's got lots of languages she's uh, mentioning there. Cabrillo, do you have time for more questions or should we wrap it up? It's up to you. Great. Well, thanks. I'm going to put up a quick picture again of our team up there in Barrow and, um, and back at home now, Elliot. And we want to thank you for participating, Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Yes, applaud. Thanks so much for all of you for joining us. Um, teachers, you can always let your teachers know they can help us join, uh, help them join Polar Trek in a couple of different ways, especially by visiting the Polar Trek website. So thanks again, and um, go ahead. And if anybody wants to say bye, go ahead right now. Sure. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending. It was awesome and thank you, Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. I'll see you all soon. Bye. Kim says goodbye too. <laughs>